in private in Christchurch since 1992. Um, started my training in 1984, so it's getting on a bit. But and it's fair to say that things in ophthalmology have changed, changed significantly in in that time. And um, in 2006, I heard the story of a guy injecting this stuff called a vas into someone's eye, and all of a sudden, max wet max generation had a treatment. And it was a sort of a, an extraordinary time. And here we are, 17 years later, it dominates what we do very much in, well, as, a, as, a med, as a retinal specialist and across the treatment of ophthalmology around the country. This may not be quite that same moment, but it's, it is the start where we now have a treatment for geographic atrophy. Um, and so that's exciting. So I'm just going to go through this. If you remember, macular degeneration is uh, degeneration at the back of the eye, and the classic sign, of course, is the drusen at the macula. And then that can go to end stage disease. Uh, it's usually early to intermediate goes to end stage, which is geographic atrophy, which is more common, or neovascular AMD. And up until now, we really haven't had a treatment for geographic atrophy other than vitamins. But now, in neovascular, of course, we've had the avastins and the ileas, etc. So just about this talk, um, it is a ma geographic atrophy is a major cause of blindness in New Zealand. I'm going to discuss the presentation and progression of GA and discuss the imaging. I'm going to dis um, discuss a new FDA approved treatment for GA. And then what's going to be the role of optometry because you guys are going to play a big part in this undoubtedly. And then uh, we'll just have a short talk about 2RT just to uh, round it off. So geographic atrophy, as you know, it's a present of sharply demarcated at atrophic lesions, which where really you've lost the photoreceptors, the RPE, and usually the underlying cori capillaris. And it's irreversible function loss. And um, it's off, but in both eyes, it's often symmetrical. Um, just taking back to basics, the normal retina, and concentrating in this area of the RPE where the photoreceptors um, uh, sit against, and then you've got Brooks membrane, and then the choroid underneath here. Macular generation is early stages as the drusen, and these drusen collect between the Brooks membrane and the RPE, and then from there the disease progresses either to that wet uh, or the neovascular type and the atrophic macular degeneration. Term, GAS to turn the term geographic because it's like the map of a country. I hope, can you see that there? That's sort of a, there's an atrophy in the middle there. So what's the burden of geographic atrophy? In the UK is a paper from 2017 from Chakrabarti and she found that 7.1% uh, of um, those people that presented with geographic atrophy were worse than blind, gener blind registration on diagnosis. 71% um, were ineligible to drive, 16% became illegally blind with an average of 6.2 years, and um, six, two thirds lost their driving license in approximately 1.6 years. And, there, and of course that's the other thing is just People often think, you know, if you have atrophic maturation, it can become wet. People say, "What well, am I, doctor? Wet or dry?" Um, but you can become, you can be, you can be both. Um, so the impact on vision is that it, the Stellan acuity is often very good. They might see six nine, um, but they have real difficulty with reading because they've got scotomas uh, like this and and a difficulty in reading and then they have difficulty with glare and low luminance. Uh, dark adaptation is slow, that going from light to dark, and driving is difficult. And a lot of people with, you'll see with geographic atrophy, have taken themselves off the road at night um, because they just, there's too much glare and they just can't see. And this is a, I like this diagram in that this is the outline of damage, and this guy's got 
Oh, her son's got this little bit of retinal pigment epithelium surviving in the centre here. And so, yes, he can see 6, 9, uh, S, and he'll read that by going along, 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 like that. But, you know, that's not necessarily what you want to see driving down the road. Um, and so what's changed in ophthalmology in, well, OCTs really sort of 2003, I think we got our sort of first one. It's been a, and then these other imaging factors have made a big difference in our ability to image what's going on with macular degeneration. So you've got colour photography, you've got fundus photoautofluorescence, fluorescein angiography, we don't do so much. One thing that's missing out of here is OCT, a, OCT angiography, which we tend to use a bit more now. And then there's on fuss uh, OCTs, which is giving you an image of the RPE changes, and then your typical OCT. All, all of these things help us in our diagnosis of people with macular degeneration and the progression of geographic atrophy. What has become a big thing in, in research in, in particular, but in what I do and when I see patients is fundus autofluorescence. So the RPE cells, which are everywhere, are full of lipofushkin, and if you uh, excite them, those cells with um, uh, about 480 nanometer light, it will express uh, at 600 nanometers, and so you get this autofluorescence. And of course, you don't get much at the uh, photoreceptors because the luteal pigment is, absorbs that. And there's none, of course, in the blood vessels. Uh, and that's become a big part because if you get these dark areas is where you've lost the RPE, there is no lipofushkin, there's nothing to fluoresce. And, and what you can see also where around this, I'll just mention, I'll talk about it later, is what we call hyperautofluorescence around the edges which is usually um, use as a sign that those cells are in trouble and are probably dying. Um, so this is the sort of appearance you might see in autofluorescence, an area of atrophy here, and then a big area, a unifocal area of geographic atrophy. And then you can assess, so a lot of what we do, you can assess how these change. And so here's someone, um, 2008, 2009, difference and you can see that um, this is slowly getting bigger. The, pho the photoreceptors, the fovea is here and it's slowly being gobbled up. Um, it's hard to tell exactly if that's gone, you need an OCT to see whether that's actually gone through the fovea yet. Fortunately the fovea is often the last bit to go. So how do we give patients a prognosis? Um, it's a, a very variable disease. Um, there's lots of different factors that can predict what happens. I'm not really going to go into these other factors, but what about the lesion factors? So we look at size, the, where they, where, how big it is, where it is, and is it, small, is it one, is it a lot, multiple areas? So what they found is, is the larger the lesion, the faster it grows. Um, and, and similarly, if you have a unifocal lesion, that grows slower than a multifocal lesion. These are multifocal areas. Uh, and, that, the, and so if you're looking at someone and trying to predict, are they going to get worse? Multifocal is worse than unifocal. And then extra foveal lesions, those, Foveal lesions uh, away from the fovea grow faster than lesions that are at the fovea. So these are helpful in giving an idea of what might happen to that patient that's in front of you. And then the other thing I was going to talk about is that autofluorescence, hyperautofluorescence, which is this is a pattern that has no hyperautofluorescence, a little focal bit there, patchy, banded, diffuse. They've got um, they can be broken up into different parts. But if you have this sort of diffuse autofluorescence or what we call diffuse trickling, that um, the progression of that uh, atrophy is a lot faster than, for instance, a, a no pattern is probably won't enlarge at all. And um, so the other thing, big, 
So that's fundus oil effrescence, which has certainly been used up to now in research and often for following patients along, and I've used it a lot in assessing my patients with geographic atrophy and following them with 2RT. Um, the other thing is the OCT, and you obviously the area of atrophy here, and you can see that where this is big thinning out here, loss of the photoreceptors in the RPE, and the classic sign of uh, light coming through where, because the RPE is not there, you do the OCT, the light comes through and you get that transillumination image. Um, other OCT features which are important, reticular pseudodrusin, which I might talk about at the end of the talk if I haven't talked for too long, because uh, it's, a, it's a specific type of max generation which does worse. Um, and is often hard to diagnose. And also, if you've got a little bit of vitreomacular traction, it, it can make uh, progress atrophy faster than without it, but probably not where we'd go in and operate, um, unless it was severe. So there are some imaging features on OCT scanning. So I just showed you that transmission thing here. Uh, which you just saw in that last patient. Another one which is more like a barcode. See these lines coming through here? You often may not see that, but there are bits again showing that this RPE, it's focally damaged and there's bits missing. And then you've got um, RPE um, starting to, is, is disappearing in this area here. Does this make sense to you in your day-to-day -day looking at OCTs? Um, and then uh, other features on OCT is that um, uh, uh, the um, reticular pseudodrusin, which are these little pointy ones here, a bit different because they come up out of the RPE, above the RPE into the photoreceptors. You get thinning of the outer nuclear layer. And the other thing here is to see in Mac generation, you can get this, these spaces of uh, uh, in a nuclear layer cavitation. And it's just an important sign for a lot of people will see that, aha, fluid, this must be near vascular AMD, we better get them into a heaven of Aston injection. But one of the things to look for there is just little lines coming through again like that barcoding would suggest that actually that's more RPE damage and that fluid there isn't actually leaking fluid, it's due to the cavitation of cells falling, collapsing down. And it's an important, it's a sign you see frequently, and I think there are a lot of people who've had injections uh, that didn't need them. OCTA can be helpful in that situation. Um, so this is just the patient I saw today, and I just wanted to say here's, here's the transmission. Here's a bit of barcoding down here. Photoreceptors are dropping off. Um, his uh, outer nuclear layer is sort of collapsing in in different places. So these are signs you're going to see in people with um, um, mac geographic atrophy. And we can see them with this, but if you put a computer onto this and start doing AI uh, examination of OCT scans, you're going to get a lot more information and the ability to predict what might happen in the future um, based on that. Um, oh, this is one again I, I saw today, and he's just, he, he's got this area of atrophy here, and just to see that a couple of bits of fluid there and think, aha, but see there's, uh, he's getting a lot of transmission there too, so there's, there's no fluid, there's, there's no near vascular membrane in that, that's just a cavitation area pocket of fluid. The other thing which is, I've, I think some, quite interesting and which I probably didn't know before I did this talk in some ways, is that we see the RPE loss, but the photoreceptors die before the IP RPE does. And I don't know if I really knew that until recently. So if you see an area of RPE loss, there's going to be a greater area of photoreceptor loss. Uh, so the area of the the clinical effect is greater than what you're seeing on a on a um, on fundus autofluorescence anyway, and this is where AI is probably going to be helpful in assessing 
progression of macular degeneration. So, talked about what geographic atrophy is, we've talked about what the signs of it is, what can we do about treating it? And this is a graph of, that shows progression of geographic atrophy over time. And by the time you've got there, you've, you've down to 660 or, or worse. And so if you, that's the natural progression and you can slow it down by 25%, then this is where they end up and they're still able to read. And if you get it to 50%, then the, again, the, the effect is less. So the ability to treat this now becomes an important thing. And uh, we know that in general, well, we just said before, what is it, uh, 6.2 years of going from showing up with um, geographic atrophy in the UK before you registered blind, on average. So I've been involved in uh, these clinical trials. I mentioned them these a few years ago, and I talked about it at the uh, college um, uh, meeting here a couple of years ago. Uh, this one is the one which I'm going to talk about. And we were involved in the initial stage two trial and then stage three, and we're now in an extension of the stage three called the Gale. And um, we'll talk about that in a minute. And it's quite exciting to be in a clinical trial that actually comes to fruition where a drug is available for treatment. These other two, this one is just finished. We didn't get anyone to that trial. We tried out a few and we've got about five patients in this one at the moment. So one of the things is the complement pathway and with the genetic uh, risk factors, we know that 50, if the classic things, patients come in to see you, you say, what are the risks? And one of the things you ought to say, well, you tell your children and you tell your siblings that you've got macular degeneration because if you've got it, there's a 50% chance that they will. And then part of those genes that are involved in that uh, is the complement system. And there's a whole lot of um, genes that are associated with the complement system where it becomes overactive, which is associated with increased risk of macular degeneration, in particular atrophy. And I've done studies also that can show histopathologically that there is complement factors inside drusen and in the choroid. This is the, um, uh, the, the complement system. It's a, it's a, a body defense system that attacks cells that have got, you know, um, uh, different pathways where the body's trying to get rid of foreign substances, whether they be viruses or whatever, and, um, and it sets up a, these th different pathways, which comes down to this C3 here, which, yeah, so you get this amplification loop going round and round and round, which increases inflammation and in the end kills the cell to die. We've got this drug, which was that one I was talking to you about with the Apalis study called peg cetacoplan and that blocks that pathway. And by doing so, it stops all these different things occurring and causing and stops the cell from dying. So this is a new drug. Um, and this is the trial that we have been involved with. So what we had is people that had uh, geographic atrophy and they went into the trial and they either got the drug monthly or every other month or they had sham injections where they didn't, you put them through the process but you didn't put a needle into their eye, you just made them think they might have had a needle in their eye. You put local in, you do everything else and you push something up against their eye but you're not actually uh, giving them the injection. And we they followed these over uh, 24 months and the uh, the, mostly they were looking at the change in the size of the geographic atrophy. Other things they were looking at was uh, corrected vision uh, and in our, we were part of the OAKS study and the OAKS study was different because they used microperimetry to assess the area of damage and we're one of the two places in the country that has a microperimeter. Um, so, and we're one of the few people in the clinical trial that has microperimetries as well. Um, so that was the study, the inclusion, these are the inclusion things, basically people over 60 with GA excluding other things, and they had to have a certain size 
and they could be multifactorial. If they were, they had to be greater than 1.25 millimetres squared. And um, so that was the group we were looking at. So these were the results of the people getting the injections monthly or second monthly. So this is the area of enlargement over time. This is the sham, so the people not getting the injection. And, you, and this is the area of enlarging of the area of atrophy. And this was the uh, every uh, month is, is less than every other month, not so bad. So about reducing by 22% and 18% in that trial. And something similar, uh, that was the Oaks trial, which we were in, which did slightly better than the, the Derby trial. Um, and this was the study here, which uh, again looking at monthly um, the, pro the progression, and you can see that that over um, what's that uh, reduction in progression um, that the, over time that effect got bigger. So you got uh, the uh, oh, might, might be the next one. Oh no, it doesn't show it. But over over time that. The, gr the difference between the two gets bigger. So the longer you're taking the drug, the greater the effect. Um, and it showed that um, it, the growth was less pronounced for lesions uh, with the fovea being involved uh, than being extra foveal. Um, I'll quickly go through this. This basically showed that from a visual acuity point of view, there was no change because that it was one of the secondary functional endpoints, but there wasn't an, enough really to say that it was a visual acuity improvement. And then they looked at the, uh, similarly the sensitivity of the retina with the microperimetry, and again found that initially there was no real difference between the, the three groups. But if they did a post hoc lesion study looking at microperimetry and looked at the area just around the area of atrophy, this perilesional area, they found that um, over time that, so the, the, the threshold, uh, the sensitivity was greater loss um, at 24 months than the other group. And if you looked at the number of scotomatous points that's, uh, that in, increased over time, it was greater in the sham group than the than the uh, patients that got the treatment. What's the risks in having the drug? It's pretty much the same as having every other injection. If you, you tell patients with Avastin, what's the risk? The run risk that you tell them is there is a risk of getting endophthalmitis. If you put a needle in your eye, a bug could go with it and that could cause infection. That's not good. That's what I say to everybody. But the alternative is you don't have the injection. And fortunately, the risk of endophthalmitis is very rare, and it was in this case too. Um, they, had, they had a small number of patients uh, in, in the Oaks trial that got endophthalmitis. Um, other than that, one thing that did show though is that those people that did get the drug had an increased risk of developing neovascular AMD, uh, or they called it exudative AMD. Um, and this tended to be quite subtle uh, and not, you know, not big dramatic bleeding, but subtle fluid that was picked up and they, and that was greater, um, so 12.12% 12 .12 of the people that had monthly, 6% um, every other month and then if you were, that's the sham and you had a 3% chance. So it was four times greater in those people that were getting the drug uh, every month than those against the uh, people that got no drug. So that was, um, that's a sort of a concern, but they then treated those people with anti-VEGF and that didn't alter the visual outcome. And there's some talk now of being able to put these two drugs together so at, at the same time. Um, so the conclusion and it, um, is P, uh, pig said a co-plan slowed uh, GA growth, at both reductions of 22% and 19% in these studies at 24 months. Um, 
if you looked at the study of microperimetry, there was greater preservation of rods and cones at the borders of the GA. The safety profile is good, but there is an elevated risk of AM, exuded of AMD. But the big thing about this is that this is the start. This is the first drug you're going to hear about. But there's others sitting in the wings that are on their way to be doing something similar. And they will be complement system. There's a whole lot of different, pro, different pathways that are, they're looking at. And so from this is we have a treatment, but it's the start. And what we're going to be doing in 10 and 20 years is going to be completely different because um, this drug has started at all. So the FDA approved this drug for treatment uh, for GA in February of this year. I was just in the States and that's how much it's costing per injection. In general, the guys are giving it every second month because of that risk of increased neovascular change. Um, I talked to the Appellus people in Australia today. They're going to make a, a submitting for New Zealand to have this drug approved by MedSafe at the end of the year. Do I think we're going to use a lot of it? At the moment, probably not. But as I said, it is a discussion point I have. I've talked to a couple of patients today saying it started. So this, is, this treatment has started. In the future, there are going to be things that are going to stop people from losing vision from geographic atrophy. So I uh, just put this together. I mean, what's the role of optometry in GA management? And this is probably what it's going to be all about. Wet neovascular AMD, people come in, my vision's gone down, doctor. You look in, you see blood, you see the OCT's fluid, you send us off, that's, we're off. GA, it's pretty insidious onset, it's a slow progress, minimal change in vi visual acuity. And so, particularly as the fovea is often the last bit to go. So, um, it's going to be a different process of referral. And then these are the things, you know, who do you treat, when do you treat, which eye to treat, and how long do you treat. And basically, when treatments become available, they're likely to be, pers they're not going to be personalised, it's going to be, you know, you've got GA, this is what we do, you're going to have an injection every month or every second month. Um, if you are going to be on it, it's more likely you're going to be on it forever. Um, that's a discussion um, to people who haven't really lost any vision yet. In my way, we're going to give you an injection every, every second month. And then, um, so basically, that's the, this is what's going to have to be explained, whether they need treatment and... Um, you know, what are their risks if they don't have treatment? So, um, this is a quote from Robin Geimer, who's a, a well-known retinal specialist in Melbourne. We need to get ready for, to take on GA treatment. Um, this time will come soon. It's a daunting task, but it is an exciting one. Um, so, at the moment, again, this is Robin's, um, I've taken this from Robin's talk, actually. At the moment, local optometrist identifies patients. Patients may not be referred to ophthalmologists, which is reasonable. If patients are seen by an ophthalmologist, they may not get any imaging, depending on who you refer them to. Um, and patients may be told only to return if they notice a sudden change in their vision. But we know, right from that talk, right at the start, that if you have get diagnosed with um, GA, a median time of 6.2 years, you're going to be registered blind. And again, 66 and two thirds of those people uh, will be not driving in, in less than two years. So who do you treat? Uh, this is a patient um, with multifocal uh, ge geographic atrophy. Um, vision's good, no problems. Same, same patient, actually, I've just taken one eye. This is the right eye. So this is 
2018. Oh, sorry, I've cut off. But this is this is about two. This is about three years later, and you see that progress in the five years starting to come a bit dodgy. Would you treat it that? Possibly not. Would you treat it that? Yeah, I'd be. If that, particularly if the other eye was already gone, you might consider some treatment. So there's lots of unanswered questions here. Uh, when and how often patients need to be reviewed? What's the Im what imaging do you perform? And when do you refer to an ophthalmologist? And I think we're going to have algorithms that are going to help us with that, with those OCT scans. Um, Um, and this again is, I think, my, this is um, from, still from Robin Geimer actually, but I probably I'd say I adhere with that. If you see GA, particularly if it's, it's getting bigger, then uh, refer. Ophthalmologists and ophthalmology now needs to start imaging these people and imaging them well so you can, and maybe they take that image away with them, particularly autofluorescence, and say, this is what I was like. Two years ago, you come back and say, oh gosh, you have progressed a lot. Um, and then it's going to be educating ourselves and educating the patients. So the conclusion of this GA talk is treatment is here. Um, but uh, someone described it as that you're drowning, but you're drowning more slowly. Um, I think I think that's a bit unfair, but it's it, it's not. What we really want is a drug that you give once and it stops the geographic getting ge geographic change getting worse, or in fact reversed it, which seems less likely. Um, but it's a start. Knowing Pharmac funding in New Zealand will be slow or never. It took us eight years to get idea funded, and we're still not funded for vein occlusions. Um, Imaging is going to be really important to assess that progression. And like the main thing with Neovascular AMD and Avastin and all that was that OCT and Avastin came together. Without, the one, without, without an OCT or Avastin would have been extremely difficult to, man, to manage and monitor patients. And so I think in, in geographic atrophy it's going to be AI and OCT is going to tell us the direction we go with treating these people. Um, that's another talk. Um, and I think optometry is going to have a big role in this, in this growing epidemic, probably you'd call it, of uh, blind geographic atrophy and blindness. Is there any questions about that? Um, so, one of the things I've talked about now, we've gone about all about, about how we might actually treat people who have got geographic atrophy, um, but what about can we stop people from this position getting to there? And that's what this laser is doing over here. So. It's called 2RT laser, retinal rejuvenation. It's a marketing toy and I probably shouldn't use that term, but it's, I actually, I don't like the term, but I think the two R's stand for risk reduction. Um, that's my marketing tool. And so this is the laser here. It's a 532 nanometer laser. It's got a 400 micron spot, which um, it doesn't, it isn't a solid, burn, it's, it's very, it's isolated round into small areas and it's a 3 nanosecond uh, pulse, so very brief, 10 to the minus 9. And with this treatment we don't treat the drusen, so if this patient came to see me and I was going to treat them, we treat around them. And, you'd, and I'll it's obviously I'll tell you why in a minute. And the whole idea of this was a bit like that photo you saw before of the geographic atrophy. You can, if you can pull back time, so if you can, if people are going along this way and they got macular degeneration and their vision is going to deteriorate like this, if you can give them a treatment which extends out that time, then they're going to keep their vision for longer. Um, 
and uh, if we can do that, then we're going to slow that progression to the wet or to, the, or near, uh, to atrophic AMD. So this is um, what happens with the laser. It, it's absorbed by the RPE and you get a burn light, but it's scattered. You don't destroy every RPE cell. You, just, you, you damage some of them. And this is the beam, sort of the power that goes across that area. So only 10 to 40% of the cells that are in that area are going to be, have some damage done to them by the laser. Um, and this is how it works. They, um, it stimulates uh, cell division by you have the RPE cells and you treat them with um, the 2RT. It causes an area of RPE loss, but then those cells, uh, by, by, because the micro, micro bubbles around melanosomes in the cell expand and they cause cellular damage. But then uh, it leads to some cell death, but then cells regenerate. And so you get new cells growing into the area of space. So these cells are hopefully healthier than the ones that might have been there before. Um, as well as that, you can see little microglia grow into the retina and they help clear out drusen. And then the other thing they see is that the Brooks membrane between the RPE and the choroid becomes thinner. Um, so this is a, and the, and the basic science of this is extremely good out of, um, out of Melbourne and Professor Erica Fletcher who's done a lot of these studies. This was, they showed this, uh, so here's an area that's been treated and here's new dividing cells. This was an eye, this is a human eye that had been enucleated. Um, and they've already found that same thing happens in mice. And they found that in, they found that in humans, and they found in mice that the, the which have thick basement membrane, it, when you give them the laser, the um, Brooks membrane gets thinner. And so Brooks membrane is a big block to nutrition to the retina, or part, uh, is, a, is a block to the, uh, the retina, and if you can make it thinner, then that should give the retina a better blood supply. And this is this lovely thing, I just love, this is this microglia growing and in, coming into the retina and growing down into the um, photoreceptor layer. That was in, that was in, um, a mouse, but this is in humans. So they see the same thing happen. The, and these can come in and down into the, into the RP layer and remove some of that drusen debris. So there is a study called the LEAD study out of Australia uh, and Ireland, um, and they found that they treated people uh, with the 2RT over a, a three year period and found that there was, in those people that didn't have reticular pseudodrusen, at the time the trial was studied, they didn't realise that reticular pseudodrusen was such a different disease. And so once they removed out of the study the results from the reticular pseudodrusen, they found that um, the uh, progression of the disease, this is showing here cumulative aggression of of, damp, of the uh, drusen uh, was significantly less than those people that got the 2RT laser. Um, and this was the result of that study. They found that if you took out of the study, if you remove the reticular pseudodrusen patients, 77% um, had a reduction in progression of the macular degeneration there's four times less chance of them going to the wet or uh, atrophic macular degeneration. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, and so what do you, what would you refer? Well, intermediate AMD. Again, I probably can't, there's a drusen there. 
and an intermediate drusen is 125 microns, which is about the size of the vein coming out of the disc. Similar sort of size, just to give you a bearing. Uh, so these are intermediate, big, these are large drusen, uh, which, and these are just some of the results. Now, initially when we, I've been doing this since 2016, initially we were pretty hung up about seeing drusen disappear. Um, drusen disappear anyway. If you have a natural history of drusen is to disappear over time, but when they do disappear, you get atrophy and loss of the cells. What's happening here is we're seeing the drusen disappear without atrophy happening. So this was a quite a dramatic case, big drusen here, 2RT laser, went from that to that, and without any visual loss. Um, and we monitor, we've monitored them with using uh, the Zeiss scanner and looking at the um, macular cube, and you can see this is the, the, how much the, the RPE is raised and how that can change over time. And similarly, you can look at the, take out the RPE in the Zeiss study, you know, and you can look, this is the map of the RPE before treatment and then after treatment. So just a few cases, it's, um, this is, um, so this is a, just a simple drusen again disappeared. Um, this guy here, intermediate drusen, dis uh, mo disappeared again, no atrophy, um, similar. This is a good one I just saw this week, although uh, here's his, Drusen here, and the other thing is, this usually is a sign of things getting worse. When you see this in the OCT, it's pigment. That's pigment getting into the into the retinal layers. That drusen's gone, and the, and these change these RP changes have gone too. So um, the nanosecond laser, I think, is a I. It, it's like everything, you can't say it's going to work in everybody, but I've had great results. Um, I've just showed a few of them there. Um, it's be, it has been FDA approved um, at the moment. Um, there's a bit of resistance in the US uh, for the laser, a concern about every man and his dog hopping on uh, and lasering away at Drusen. Uh, so they, they're, setting, they're doing another large clinical trial in patients with geograph uh, with with sorry, without uh, reticular pseudodrusen, and they're going to see if they can emulate the lead study. David Worsley, who's an ophthalmologist uh, in Hamilton, there's only two of us doing two RT laser in, the, in in New Zealand. He's um, done. He's looked at 120 cases over three years and had similar results to the lead study. So, um, I'll probably stop there, yeah. Um, thanks. <laughs> Just a one-off treatment to it. Oh, no, uh, well, so thank you, that's a good point. Uh, so, in the clinical trial, they did um, they did a small number of treatments. I think it was 12 up and above, above uh, there's six above and six below the, the fovea. And they did that quite, they, did a, a, they repeated that several times through the trial, depending on what happened with the drusen. I've never done that. I've always treated more. And there was a recent paper actually where they did 100 treatments and found that that had no detrimental effect to the retina. In fact, it was... Uh, it was increased the retina sensitivity. So I think they probably undertreated um, in that trial. So I treat uh, usually probably around 40 treatments in total, 40 to 50 treatments in total when they have a treatment, and I don't think of retreating them for at least a year. And um, if they and if they're needing more than three or four, then probably not working. Um, I don't think, yeah, four would be the maximum I've ever given for a treatment. Um, and that's probably, I think that's because 
one eye was worked really well and the other eye didn't. And I don't quite understand that either. But um, so mostly people get away with one or two treatments, but it's, it's you have to follow them over time. What sort of VA are you treating? So have they got a reduction of VA at the time? No. No, you're trying to get them before that. You're trying to, uh, they're showing up with those, you know, drusen, retinal pigmental changes, unaware that they had macular generation. And they've got that look. Um, I was going, one of the things is, um, one of the things is a big part of the clinical trial is you have to uh, differentiate uh, those patients that have reticular pseudodrusen. I did put that on the end of my talk, but I thought I'd probably talk for too long. Um, but reticular pseudodrusin is clinically quite hard to see. Um, and unless you do OCT scans and fundus autofluorescence, you of, often will miss it. And so, but I don't, David and I have treated people with reticular pseudodrusin before the lead study came out and didn't find that to be detrimental, but we have swayed away from using it since that clinical trial suggested that wasn't a good idea. And it actually makes sense because it is certainly a, it's a different disease. But also happy to treat people if they have had a reduction of VA, say if they're 6 over 12 and open to it, or is it? Yes, as long as they, I mean, again, um, there isn't any evidence that once you've got geographic atrophy that the laser helps. It, you might think that it should, and I have treated, and David and I have both treated people with a small area of atrophy in one eye, where the other eye got, has got a big area of atrophy. But I don't, well, we're a little bit reticent because, again, the science, the, the, just there isn't those results. So we like to treat them before they get damage. Does it cover medical insurance? Well, it is. It's, uh, it's, it, we're trying, we are trying to slow the process down so that we, because we know the natural history of macular generation is they get worse. And, and the people that are particularly interested are the people whose mother and parents have gone blind from macular generation. What's the cost? It's $1,400 per eye. So, anyway, I'm hoping that, you know, in 20 years' time, just like we're talking about the time that we heard about the first Avacin injection that you'll think about the time you heard about the first treatment for, for geographic atrophy. And it won't be the same drug. Um, there'll be something better, but it is the start. And um, from that I'm quite, you know, I think that's quite exciting. And what is the leading cause of blindness in the Western world? Insurance companies. Insurance? For, for the no, it does no, it's, no, it doesn't. It's not covered. We've tried, but it's um, yeah. Uh, th they don't like anything new, essentially. Um, it's very hard to get past. And the other one is the the new drug. I mean, I just can't see that being funded in New Zealand, um, and 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 reasonably enough too. Actually, I'm not saying that they sh it should be. Um, because it, you know, it's such a, it's a big area to treat, and it would involve so many people, and um, and the results are sort of good, but they're not, you know, it, it, from an individual point of view, if you've got lost one eye and you've got a little bit, come, you lose pretty close to losing your central vision the other, maybe you'd give it a go. But um, the thing is, I say to me, this is the exciting bit is is, is that this drug is available. And so it will mean that other drugs are going to follow. Um, and you know, the, this company is very excited to be the first cab off the rank in the U US. Um, but there'll be more to come. John, with that um, exit um, you see the reduction in um, development of size of lesions. But you said there was no um, reduction in deterioration of visual acuity. Is that something that they might be hoping to see in the future with other drugs? Yeah, well, again, it, it's, um, again, it wasn't so surprising because their main thing was seen looking at the growth of the area. And so if your phobia is involved, um, 
it's not going to, your vision's not, so either your fovea doesn't get involved, so it doesn't change, but, um, so it wasn't a surprising result. We'd certainly want to have, a, we're, that's what we'd like to see, is that no progression of visual loss. Um, so again, it, it, it's, um, it's um, exciting in, in some ways, but it's, it's not, uh, as I say, it's not the end all drug, this one. Uh, because the one we want is the one that will give you one injection and it doesn't get worse. And that'll happen one day, I'm sure. Um, but um, not yet. Did you, if there was someone who was up for it, possibly end of this year, you Yes. Yeah. I, I think so. And I, again, I have no idea of price or anything else like that, but um, these things tend to sit, if it goes for anything like ILEA and all the other drugs, they tend to sit around $2,000. That seems to be the market sort of price. Um, the difficulty is, again, if you give the injection, you can't really see. It's not you give a Vastin, there's a palpable difference in their vision usually, and certainly on OCT scanning. It's not going to be the same with this. So it's a, that's where, again, the OCT AI thing is going to be important. And you guys are going to be right at the work face. Because <laughs> they're going to come and see you and you're going to say, well, this is what you've got and um, there's something you might be able to do about it. Because that's the thing up until now. It's like when I first started in ophthalmology in, 1980, in the 80s, we used to see people with an ear vascular AMD and say, well, you've got, and here's your white stick. And, um, and it changes. Anyway, so thanks a lot. Now, I do have another exciting thing to announce tonight, because you might have already read Dixon, um, but it, one of the great things about being an old ophthalmologist in town, apparently I'm the senior statesman now. <laughs> oh, no, Rob Weatherhead always beats me, that's right. <laughs> He's always going to beat me, so that's good. But, um, uh, but uh, it's always good to see new doctors come back to Christchurch, and so we're really pleased to have Dixon Wong come along. and join us with his experience of plastic surgery and glaucoma. Pardon? Glaucoma, that's right. Yeah. Above of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so it's just great to have him, in, have him on board and at Southern Eye Specialists. And <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for coming. <laughs>